Is what has been happening at Free Chapel with Jensen Franklin and Perry Stone a legitimate revival? Doesn't that sound so haughty, by the way? A legitimate revival, like who are we? I get so annoyed when people are just kind of judging and discerning who's right and who's wrong. It's really not the angle we're gonna be taking with this because the Spirit of God is moving there. We're so excited about what's happening. But there is a prophetic warning for other ministries in this that our dear friend Larry Sparks has on his spirit. He publishes the prophet, he has his finger on the pulse, what God is doing in many different streams. And we're gonna be talking about this revival, going into the details and what it means for you. Here he is, Larry Sparks. Larry Sparks, it's good to have you back on Encounter today. Well, thank you, brother. I, I so appreciate you guys being willing to capture in real time what the Holy Spirit is saying and doing. Mm. So this is amazing. Well, I always say this, that you more than anyone else I know has your finger on the pulse of what's happening in the body because you're just connected with so many different voices from so many different streams mm. and the Holy Ghost, you had an encounter with the Lord I did through a live stream yeah. of a revival that's taking place and God began to speak to you prophetically. There's a prophetic warning in this. There's so many lessons in what we're going to talk about. So I'm su super excited. So now let's, let's go back to this moment where you're, you're about to be knocked out of your chair in yeah. your office. What's going on? I'll tell you exactly what happened. While I was there watching this revival that's been going on, and I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about the origins of it at Free Chapel, Jensen Franklin's church there in Gainesville, Georgia, Perry Stone was leading, it had to be 3,000 people, in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, I just got to say this because all sorts of stuff is going to come out, Alan, and I just feel the Holy Spirit's going to be completely in charge of this time together. But there is a bit of an affront. There's a, a bit of a warning. Here we are in the 21st century right now. We're seeing all sorts of things happening, chaos and crisis, confusion, mm -hmm. the church being in a place of disunity, people having arguments over nonsense. And one of the things that's grieved my heart is I know there are people who are, I think, genuinely hungry for more, for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, but they've gone what I call Pentecostal light wow. in, in the sense I've been to gatherings, I've been to meetings where they're trying to maybe please the Pentecostal people. And it's like, all right, if you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, you don't, we, we, God's not going to make you uncomfortable. God's not going to do anything weird. You just sit in your chair, maybe lift your hand, just tell him, God, fill me. And then basically you can go to lunch afterwards. <laughs> that was not what was happening. And, and usually that happens in larger, what I call more non-denominational, yes. neo-Pentecostal churches that have Pentecostal history, but they don't have Pentecostal practice. Mm. Now, what I saw at Jensen Franklin's church, and I love the guy because he actually was born spiritually in Pentecost. Yeah. He's a wonderful preacher, but I'll be totally candid, following Jensen Franklin Free Chapel for the last maybe 15 years, I'm like, okay, they're more of a non-denominational mega church, and maybe I, I probably inappropriately judge them, hmm. but here I am watching this service, Perry Stone's up there leading 3,000 people in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, opening the altar, people running up there, Literally, him giving the instruction from the stage saying, listen, if you feel like the Spirit of God is on you so greatly that you're going to fall back, just literally get to your knees. Nobody was discouraging manifestations of the Holy Spirit. No one was saying, well, we don't believe in the weird stuff. There was such an openness. There was such a hunger. And literally, I'm watching this, and you could feel feel the anointing. I felt the anointing and the presence of the Holy Spirit literally come off the screen. And then just as he was starting to lead them in praying out loud in tongues, I'm going to say that again. He mm -hmm. was leading them, leading, th at least there was a thousand at the altar, yeah. um, pr leading them praying out loud in tongues. Literally the electric, well, I feel it now, the electric mm -hmm. presence of the Holy Spirit touched me as I'm watching there, just me, myself in my office. I started to shake. I actually started to vibrate. I couldn't, uh. I couldn't control it. And then I, had, I stood up because I'm like, Lord, this type of thing doesn't happen to me often. Can God do it? Yes. Um, but I'm watching this, and I'm literally getting a residue of the anointing that's being poured out in that room. And I literally, I almost fell out of my chair. It was a violent encounter with the presence of God. Well, brother, what, you know, God's not going to do something to make you feel uncomfortable. I wasn't necessarily uncomfortable. I was overwhelmed by the power mm. of the living God who was moving. I guess the bottom line, he was moving so strongly, so powerfully in that atmosphere in Gainesville, Georgia, 
hundreds of miles away from where I'm watching in Texas, that anointing can be released through the screen. And Brother Allen, as we go on, I'm going to pray that that same presence of the Holy Spirit Hey, even even between, I mean, what I love about you, brother, is you love the move of the Holy Spirit. You are Pentecostal through and through. Yeah. And for the days ahead, we cannot afford to go light mm. or muted on the presence and power of the Spirit. So that's what happened to me. Well, and... you, you, know, you know as well as I do, these ministries, as they grow in influence, they kind of build a reputation. Yeah. And it becomes streamlined and it, they it's it's spit shined and it's and it looks perfect and pristine and they get in that and so much is invested in it that they don't want to rock the boat, if you will, with a dramatic Pentecostal. They often feel as though they can address it in more respectable ways. Yeah. And as far as being pristine and having built this amazing structure. Uh, Free Chapel is is about as good as it gets yes. as far as the structure that they built, the organization that they have. So there's a lot on the line yeah. uh, for an ministry and organization like that. And then for them to embrace publicly the moving of the Holy Spirit as brazenly as they have is yeah. it is a sign that we'll talk about here in a moment. Two mega churches that you've mentioned around the country, but how did this start? So where did this come from? They're still having meetings they're still, at the recording of this broadcast. At the recording of this broadcast, they are still having meetings, and their perspective is, we will go as long as the Holy Spirit gives us clearance to go. Hmm. So what happened, and this is so interesting because this is kind of the prophetic significance to all of this, is that Jensen Franklin, probably because of the climate that we are currently living in, said we're going to do, I think it was like a three or four week Sunday night series on signs of the times, signs mm -hmm. of the end times. So he brought in people like Jimmy Evans, who you've yes. interviewed, John Hagee, and he finished it with his longtime friend, Brother Perry Stone. And, and you know, I, I followed Brother Perry for years, and you know his teaching would make my you know hair blow back because that the man would find all sorts of interesting prophetic parallels and significance mm -hmm. in the scriptures. And uh, but needless to say, Perry was there to finish off their signs of the times series Sunday night. You watch that particular service, nothing particularly impressive happens, mm -hmm. which is very interesting, Alan, because you study Father's Day 1995 at Brownsville. That's right. Nothing spectacular happened. Exactly. Yes. Or even January 1994. During the service which, at Toronto, nothing usually unusual happens during the service. It's how will you steward those moments towards mm -hmm. the end where the altars are open. I've asked the Holy Ghost on yes. this right now, Alan. I almost feel like something builds during a service like that. Hunger builds. I think there is just building hunger for God in that environment, in that atmosphere. Mm. And sadly, as we've seen, many people are moving away from what we call an altar call or having altars. In other words, a place where people come to the front of the church and encounter God. That's bottom line. We're not being overly mystical about it. It's a place where people can encounter God. Mm -hmm. And I remember our friend Kim Owen saying, in the 21st century, what's happened is more stage and seating has replaced the altar space. Yes. I'm going to say that again. We've, we've built larger stages for our productions and for our entertainment and all that kind of stuff. And we put more seats in the church so we can have more people showing up. And as a result, the area that has suffered is that sacred space where mm. people can come forward and encounter God. So Perry Stone finished his end times message. He gave an altar call and people came forward, uh, I believe, to receive the Lord, to rededicate their lives to the Lord, to repent. That's what I love about that brother. He preaches sin. He preaches repentance because he's Church of God Cleveland. He's yeah, he old is. school. Yeah. And I said, we got to get back to some old school Pentecost. But that's a whole other conversation. Mm -hmm. He invites people forward, and I just study it because in that atmosphere, as the Holy Spirit's pouring out on all these, I get thousands. I mean, I, I have to say at least hundreds coming forward, thousands being impacted. Perry Stone and Jensen Franklin just have this understanding in the Spirit. God's doing something unusual. There's a real invitation for us to keep going, and as a result, since that service, they've been going near nightly. Um, I think the only day, only day they took off was a Saturday. Um, and then, of course, I sh I, I, I've been watching quite a bit. But what I noticed about this, even different than Asbury, and I think Asbury opened something in the spirit. I'm very grateful for what God did. 
but at the service you and I were talking about that I was watching where God mm -hmm. hit me, they are extremely demonstrative, not theatrical, but they are demonstrative in allowing the Holy Spirit to come and do what he wants. So often we give the Spirit wow. of God terms to work with. Mm -hmm. We tell him what. That is why we don't see a greater manifestation of power because we have these gatherings and we have the audacity to say, okay, Holy Spirit, I want revival, but I don't want any of that shaking stuff or I don't want people weeping or heaven forbid somebody gets touched by joy and they start laughing. We love to try to tell the Holy Spirit what to do. And in these meetings, in this mega church. I'm not seeing anybody who has an agenda that they're trying to put on the Holy Spirit. They're literally saying, Holy Spirit, you dictate our agenda. It's powerful. Wow. There's so much to unpack there. And I, I think to start with, the, the theme that they began with, which I think they yeah. basically continued with, is the signs of the times. Yes. Could it be that there is an open door for the word? Because as you mentioned, these these demonstrative things don't happen when revival breaks out. It's the Spirit of God moving yeah. on hungry hearts. Yeah. But people are hungry as they see what's happening in the world right now. What is going on? Are these the last days? What is God's plan for the coming future? And is that an open door, do you think? Do you think as ministers, and if I could, if I could preface it with this, uh, Kim Clement, we're, gonna, we're doing a, um, a report on him very, very soon. In the last few years of his life, repented on three major things. Most people aren't aware of this, and we're going to be showing clips of this on our program on Encounter Day, so stay tuned for that. But he repented for not focusing on eschatology in the end times and even mocking it because he said he didn't understand it, and as far as he was concerned, people were using it as kind of a, a reason to hide and not be engaged and to be judgmental. And, and he said as a result, he just took the opposite the opposite perspective. And I think a lot of people in the prophetic community have found themselves prophets, by the way, they, they generally go the other way. When they rejoice when the people weep. They weep when the people rejoice. If they see a perceived error, they go to the opposite extreme in order to correct that error. That's just the nature of what they do. And he had done that. And in the last few years of his life, he repented for that because he began to understand how important it was to understand eschatology. He'd even become a replacement uh, a theologian kind of in his mind until he was standing in Israel and he said, there was something special where I was and I wanted to communicate it, but I couldn't because I didn't believe that Israel could be special. And he started to dig into it and recognize that God still has a plan for Israel. Well, and it's true. And just to add on, my wife works very closely with Lance Wall now. Lance traveled right. with Kim Clement. Lance mm -hmm. was very close with him. And Lance even said that in his latter years, Kim started to receive from people. Oh, goodness. I'm trying to think. Chuck, Chuck Missler. Yeah, yes. yeah. Yeah. Okay. You're on the same. So it's just very interesting yeah, that he had those um, regrets or just second thoughts about end times and eschatology because we yeah. are literally seeing signs of the times right now. He actually, he prayed and said, God, I need, I know what, because he, he started to pastor people and he realized that as a pastor, he said, where I would skip over verses in the past, you know, because uh, I mean, I'm a prophet or an evangelist and I could just focus on one verse here and one verse here. As a pastor, I need to dig into the whole counsel of the word of God. And since one out of every four verses is a prophecy, um, I needed to study prophetic. I said, God, send me, send me your best. And he said, his wife was listening to Chuck Missler and he yeah. sat down and listened for hours and hours and hours. He eventually became a spiritual son to Chuck Missler and receive from him. And so people who want to know kind of the direction Kim Clement went in, watch Chuck Missler. He was all in 100% on uh, Chuck's teachings, as which he's, he's phenomenal. He's out of this world. Oh, yeah. So the question is then, um, I, I think the prophetic community needs to take a page from Kim Clement's book and understand that it's not enough to prophesy future events out of our own spirit. We must look at what the Bible says concerning the last days because hearts are hungry. Do you, do, you, do you feel like that this is an opportunity for ministers to say, you know what, we, we probably should get back to some eschatology? I, I agree. But here, here's the interesting thing. I think we've, we've gone two extremes. And, and I've seen it in, in our prophetic charismatic world. Uh, you know, and I've been part of all of it. I've been part of 
um, what you'd call watching the rise of, unfortunately, preterism. And then, of course, yes. you have partial preterism. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have things like amillennialism and that type of thing. But then you also have, I'd call, hyper-dispensationalism, um, where it, it becomes all about the end times and the unfolding of end times events, which we need to be aware of, which we need to be educated on. But, but I, everything I think, becomes a sign. But so it's that, either that, nothing that, is a sign or everything is a sign, right? That, that's 100%. And, I, and I, what I always tell people is this, okay? I think in the pulpit, it's actually wise for us to have teaching and conversation and the charts and the graphs. We need to preach on eschatology. We need to preach on signs of the times. We need to simultaneously recognize what is the sure prophetic word that we can actually build our lives on mm -hmm. concerning the last days, concerning yes. the end times. A lot of it, I don't want to say speculation, a lot of it we're still... Um, we're trying to understand. I of mean, course. even the book of Daniel. Daniel ends with him talking about that these eschatological images. So so much of what he prophesied about it's almost it's being sealed up for the time of the end. Yes. So there's a lot of mystery there. But the good news is this, and maybe this is just the heart of a revivalist, is that there is one sign of the times that we can build on, and it is that Joel two Acts two prophecy that in the last days God says what well, He could have said a whole lot of things characterizing and describing the last days. He could have described a, a one-world government, one-world currency. He could have talked about the identity of the Antichrist. All of that is important. All of mm -hmm. it we need to talk about. But in the middle of it, he said in the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all Come flesh. On. Which, again, going back to what we're seeing in Gainesville, in Georgia, I think there's a beautiful balance of the teaching of eschatology happening, but then simultaneously the confirming outpouring of the Holy Spirit with people. I mean, I saw one testimony. Somebody was watching from a distance, just like me, and I, I'd have to go back. I think Jensen Franklin was reading it. It was funny because the guy, Jensen, was shocked by it because he hadn't read any of the testimonies. It was a lady who was watching the service. Uh, got hit by the power of God. She said, I was shaking, I fell on my knees, and I felt like God had done something. And then she went later on that week to the oncologist for an evaluation on her cancer situation. And she said, I, w I received a completely clean bill of wow. health. She got what we would call, whoa, healed in the glory. Yeah. Healed in the manifest presence of God. So... In the middle of it all, what is perhaps the greatest sign of the times? I believe that great sign of the times is the outpouring of the Spirit. Come on. And it says, on all flesh, which, again, going now into this conversation, um, I love the fact that it's happening at a big mega church. I love that it's happening at a church where they're supposed to be run by the book. They're supposed to be following the yep. handbook for successful church operation. And the funny thing is, I feel like they've just thrown that out and said, God, do whatever you want to do. Wow. It's so good because especially as someone who focuses on eschatology, one of the questions we get is, is America in Bible prophecy? And I always point to Joel chapter 2 and say... America is in Joel chapter two. Yeah, awesome. America is in Second Chronicles seven fourteen. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, that's America right. is right in the middle of those promises if we will receive it. Mm -hmm. And that's what all these things are supposed to do. All of it is supposed to make you look up, look to Him, yep. and receive from Him to receive hope and encouragement, and to know that there are things happening bigger yeah. than what we see, feel, hear, and experience, and we can trust. And we may not know. What tomorrow holds, but we know who holds tomorrow. Yeah. What do you feel? You've you've mentioned that this this revival that we're seeing, and it is legitimately a revival. Lives that. are being changed, born again, transformed, filled with the Holy Ghost. Yeah. You feel like this is a prophetic warning yeah. to modern Megan churches. You've kind of touched on this, but kind of distill that down for us. What, sure. what do you mean by that? Yeah, I, I think so many modern mega churches, and again, I'm not against mega church. If you have a mega church, that means you potentially have mega impact. Yeah. There's a lot. That means by default, there's a lot of people coming. And, and listen, I'm going to say this, and you know, people might disagree with me, and that's totally fine. Um, but let's let's just lay that out on the table. I know there's a lot of mega churches that have become extremely culturally relevant in their presentation of material. You know, we'll do series is about at the movies. We'll have extremely. Yes. Um, over-the-top, amazing production. Mm -hmm. we, we will have all uh, creativity. There's nothing, here, here's the deal, there's nothing essentially wrong with any of that if the content is biblical, 
Mm -hmm. If the preacher is uncompromising, if the preacher or the ministry leaders there are consistent about addressing contemporary cultural issues boldly from what the Bible says, and if they welcome not tolerate, not put in a back room, but if they welcome the move of the Holy Spirit, I'm not against professionalism. I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm not saying go bang some pots and pans together and call it worship. <laughs> I, 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 I'm not saying like we we believe in excellence, and there's yes. nothing. People are very quick to be like, oh man, they're doing that kind of culturally relevant sounding series. They must be bad. Not necessarily. If they are using that and preaching Bible truth, you know, it's like we can have conversations about that. But here's my problem, though, when it comes to the modern megachurch is that when we are all culturally relevant and basically the church sounds like a TED talk mm. and the pastor's more like a self help guru, that type of thing. And sadly, we're seeing a lot of that. And it's like, well, we believe in the Holy Spirit. We believe in the gifts of the Spirit, but we don't practice that in the main service. We don't practice that from the platform. We do it once a month in a special service that we don't tell anybody about. Uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm slightly exaggerating, but not, not that much. No, yeah. And then, like I said at the beginning of our conversation, we have seen a drift into what we call uh, non -con I'll call it this way non-confrontational Pentecostalism, mm. where we have embraced a neutered, watered-down baptism of the Holy Spirit, void of expectation, void of encounter, and void of experience and evidence. Now, what does that mean? We can have an interesting theological dialogue about what is the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I know Classical Pentecostal denominations, Church of God, Cleveland, Assemblies of God, and others would say it is the speaking in tongues, speaking in tongues as the initial physical evidence of the baptism of the Spirit. We can have, I think, some very robust Bible conversation about that. Here's my problem, Alan. I have such respect for those who are championing an initial physical evidence of the baptism of the Spirit, speaking in tongues or whatever, because we have actually taught a version of the baptism of the Spirit without any evidence. Wow. Yes. In other words, we are we are embracing something that's nearly a counterfeit. Like I said before, I've been in services where we want to make you as comfortable as possible, but we do believe, we do know, these people do know that there is more, that there is an experience with the Holy Spirit to be had, but sadly we are denying and depriving people of that when we give them all of these... Um, uh, almost Platitudes. apologies for the Holy mm -hmm. Spirit, saying, well, he'll never do anything strange. He won't be weird. You can just sit there, um, just lift up your hand, and then go to lunch. It's like, no, I've been in enough gatherings, and I sure know you have been too. When he falls on somebody, wow. they know it. Yes. Um, because that's God coming upon a person. And that's what I'm contending for. That's honestly, I've given my life, my ministry, to see people come into a collision with the power of God because I know that much is that he's not a concept. He's not an idea. He's a real person. And for the issues that are plaguing our nation right now, for the issues plaguing households right now, we need a God who is real, who's not just an apologetic, who's not just information. He is a real living God who rests upon us. Yeah. By definition, the word weird means otherworldly. Yeah. So true. by definition, the Holy Spirit is weird. And yeah. so are we because we're from another world. And if we're going to follow the Pentecostal model from Acts chapter 2, that there, there, there should be an explanation required. That, that's that's and so good. These people what... aren't drunk, as you suppose. <laughs> we need to explain to you this this because mm. when he falls, it's not going to be like what we've experienced on this planet. Hallelujah. Right. That's we need some otherworldly, and I'm so proud of, and I don't know if that, I don't want that to sound condescending. I'm so proud and thrilled of what Jensen Franklin and Perry Stone and what they're doing. I'm so thankful for them to make room for the moving of the Holy yeah. Spirit. They didn't have to do that. They could have been just as successful, had just as many people attend, have offerings just as big yeah. without making that available, and they've chosen to do that. I've got to declare this even just prophetically because, you know, there's a lot of good intentioned pastors and leaders out there. They have good hearts. They love Jesus. And, and they are using all of the gadgetry and the gimmicks because they genuinely want to bring people in. It's like, that's, that's the, the heart. It's like, sure. we want to cast a wide net and we want to bring in as many people as possible. But here's the deal. We were talking about Pentecost, the day of Pentecost. We've never graduated 
we have never graduated from what took place on the day of Pentecost where we say where we see there as a result of the sound of outpouring as a result of the sound of the mighty rushing wind, the fire that appeared over the people, as a result of the sound of outpouring, it says the multitudes came together. And here's my word. If we want to see the multitudes come together, we cannot be ashamed of the sound of Pentecost, mm. the sound of outpouring. It comes with groans. It comes with cries. It comes with demonstrations of power. It comes with people on their back or on their face, completely undone by the raw presence and power of God. And there's a lie, and I just want to confront this lie. It's a demonic lie that says, well, if the people come in and see that stuff, they're not going to want to have anything to do with it. May I tell you, sir, and may I tell you, ma'am, the only ones who want Want nothing to do with that are those who are a few loud and outspoken people under the influence of a religious spirit. Yeah. I promise, I prophesy that the young people that the devil is peddling his nonsense to day yes. in and day out, the, the, the ones who that publishers are putting together books on witchcraft and displays like that at Walmart, Target, and Barnes and Noble, there's a generation interested, intrigued by, and hungry for the supernatural. Come the on. true supernatural, the pure supernatural. So we have no right saying, well, because certain things like that make me uncomfortable, we're just going to shut it down. Because people falling or speaking in tongues or operating the gifts of the Spirit or people shaking, because that makes me uncomfortable, because that violates my personal preference, we're going to shut that down. Sir, ma'am, I just extend the invitation. If you want a growing church that's going to impact people right now in the days in which we live, mm -hmm. we have no time to play patty cake, Mickey Mouse. Mouse, Minnie Mouse, Disneyland Church. It is time for the church to look like Acts chapter 2 and welcome the Holy Spirit without apology. I had to get wow. that out, but Come on. it was. It says, when they heard the sound, the multitude came together. The and sound, some did mock, old. and that's okay. Yeah. Because the purely humble, those who are ready to receive, will push through the mocking. Come on. Because they sense the power and the presence yep. of the Holy Spirit. What an exciting moment we're living in. And the warning then, if I'm hearing you correctly, to mega churches yeah. is fall in line with this example. Make yourself available. Am I hearing you correctly? To the moving That's, of the Holy Spirit, because there's about to be a yeah. comparison and contrast. It's a warning with a promise. You know, mm. sometimes people think a warning is this really bad thing. No, no, the, 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 here's the, the good news of the warning. The good news is, just follow the model that you're seeing right now. Yeah. A church that really has everything to gain, nothing to lose That's at, right. at, at Free Chapel, making beautiful room for the Holy Spirit. You, I mean, truly, watch the services. That is like something we would see at a Holy Ghost revival type of service, which means you too, any church, any mega church can experience that. However, the warning is this. I believe in the days that we're going into if we decide to mute the Holy Spirit, if we decide to say, you know what, I'm just going to keep kind of doing the entertainment-based church. We're going to keep giving people that which is culturally relevant. You know, we're going to we're going to be kind of their TED Talk people. We just want to be cool. You know, we we don't. I've heard people even say we don't want that Holy Spirit stuff. Hmm. I actually believe what's going to happen is you're going to become irrelevant. That's that's yes. the warning. You will become ultimately irrelevant because here's the deal: is that if people want a good show. Truly, if they want a good show, they can go to Broadway, they can go to Taylor Swift. I'm not advocating these people, but if they want a good show, they can go to see something in the world. You, me as the church, it is not our assignment to duplicate the world. It mm. is not our assignment to try to take what the world is doing and throw a Christian label on it. It is our assignment to be distinct and separate. And the reality is people who are going to the Taylor Swift shows or Broadway, all that— if we continue to be unique and distinct and be places that host the presence and the move of the Holy Spirit, the people who are just sick to death of entertainment. Can I just tell you the world, I believe, is almost on entertainment overload. Yeah. I think they're sick and tired of it. They need a church. They need a place. They need an environment that's, wow, that's, that's different. People in the world are not crossing the threshold to come to the church because they want the world repackaged process that for a minute. That's right. If, if they're coming again. into our churches, if they're coming into our buildings, if they're coming into our atmospheres and our, our environments, they're truly being led by the Holy Spirit, and they're, they're hungry for something that they are presently not receiving and experiencing. So that's the warning. The warning is this. 
let's let's receive the encouraging side of that and say any church, no matter how big you are, no matter what direction you've gone in, you can be a place that hosts the Holy Spirit. I have no doubt any church can immediately step into revival, but the thing that you need to do is number one, recognize the move of the Holy Spirit, recognize as he's moving, and number two, be willing to lay down your reputation. Hmm. Let, let me let me say that again, because I, I felt like the Holy Spirit said to clarify those things. Yes. So Brother Allen, I'll go back to you. Number one, we need to recognize his move. There's so many people I, I've heard they've been in church gatherings and services, and we've probably been there too, where you know God wanted to do something, but the program dictated what we did next. The program said, okay, God's moving, but let's move on to the next thing. Okay, And the reality is this. I think what Jensen Franklin and Perry Stone did, I think what Randy Clark and John Arnott did, or John Kilpatrick, I'm talking about revivalists of times past, they recognized Holy Spirit's doing something different, and it's happening in a very subtle way, almost where you could miss it, where you could miss it. But they're like, we're going to seize what he's doing. And number two, um, what determines Really, what determines whether or not we step into revival, true revival, full Holy Ghost outpouring is, am I willing to lay down my reputation? In other words, am am I willing to embrace the reproach? of the outpouring of the Spirit, which is people mocking, which is people saying, you know what, I'm confused about this. I don't understand all of this. That's totally fine. We can work with that. But I think so many people in our social media digital age, we have uh, built shrines to reputation. Reputation has become such a big thing that it's like, oh, I don't even, you know, we're afraid of somebody seeing an Instagram photo or a a Facebook photo of a service where it looks like people are on their face on the ground because Mm. we're afraid, well, people will see that and they'll think we've gone Pentecostal or that God's moving. Listen, we don't have time to give God terms to work with. Listen, bottom line, you can step into full-fledged revival. You can step into a move of the Spirit or... I don't know how else to say it, Alan. You can become irrelevant for the wow. days ahead. Well, Charles Parham, one of the forerunners of Pentecost, prayed earnestly for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And ultimately, the word of the Lord, as he was seeing others filled with the Spirit, came to him and said, if you're willing to endure the persecutions, if you're willing to endure the trials, the difficulties that's going to come your way, then this full blessing shall be yours. And he said, Lord, I'm willing. I'm telling you, Leonard Ravenhill yeah. said it best, Pentecost meant not just power, but persecution to the disciples. But if you're willing to endure it, this full blessing can be yours. Larry, I feel an anointing right now. Would you pray for this blessing to fall on every single person watching? Yeah, yeah. And and the scripture that I've been burning with really since 2016, Zechariah 10.1, where it tells us what to do. Uh, it tells us mm. what to do when we see revival rain. And right now we see the rain of revival. We've seen it in Asbury. We saw it in all the college campuses earlier in the year. And now we're seeing it powerfully demonstrated here in Free Chapel. What do we do? We ask for rain. Mm. <laughs> I, do, I do feel an anointing mm-hmm. on that, Alan. So for all of you who are watching, that's what we do. You might not be able to get out there to Gainesville. I was hoping I could. But I felt like the Lord said, Larry, ooh, she, but I'm mm. not. It's like, Larry, it's not necessary Think of Apostle Tim Sheets, who had a prophetic word saying, a day is coming where within 20 miles of every person in America, there would be a hub of Holy Spirit activity and revival. I actually believe we're stepping into those days. We're no longer in the 90s. We're no longer in an age where you just go to Toronto, Brownsville, Smithton, and a few other places, Argentina. We're not there anymore. We're moving into, whoa, I believe the fullness of Acts 2 and Joel 2, where it says all flesh. All flesh is God's intended audience for the outpouring, not just three churches, not just a church here or there. So Father, I thank you for every hungry heart right now. You fill the hungry. You fill the thirsty. And for those right now who are watching to us on a personal level, not just, uh, Larry, I know what you're talking about with the church, but I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. He fills the hungry. He Mm -hmm. fills the thirsty. Just ask him. Just ask him. How long has it been since you've asked him for that refreshing rain of his Holy Spirit? Maybe you've Maybe you've prayed a prayer that sounds more complaint. Listen, I've complained to God a lot, but maybe you've prayed prayers that complain more about your dryness and your hunger and and your thirst. And he wants you to be honest, but he also wants you to ask. 
He wants you to be intentional. So that's my encouragement right now, that you'd say, God, I ask for that rain, that refreshing of revival. I thank you, Lord, that your word says in Isaiah that you'd pour out water on the dry ground. Father, I thank you that you said, even according to your word in Joel 2 and Acts 2, that in the last days, and we're in the last days, you'd pour out your spirit on all flesh. God, I'm all flesh. I'm part of that all flesh. I'm part of that prophecy, God. My my family's part of that prophecy. My son or daughter right now who's going far from God is part of that prophecy. So God, I ask even right now that you pour out your spirit. I feel the presence and power of the Lord just falling on people. I want to encourage you to even notify Alan, notify his team. has little to do with me, everything to do with your hunger, everything to do with your thirst. He fills all the hungry. He fills and he satisfies the thirsty. We are living in the days of revival reign, and your assignment is to simply ask him individually and for churches and gatherings and all of that. Come together and ask him corporately. Mm. He is pouring out his spirit. And as I always say, no one's safe. <laughs> no one is safe from what God is doing right now. And I'm very grateful for that. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. No one is safe. <laughs> from his presence no place is safe from the power of revival wow praise the lord larry i can't thank you enough for sharing that and for being such a mighty partner of revival in this nation the lord has need of you no what you've done what you're doing is nothing to be compared with what you're about to do in the spirit Mm. and we're so thankful to partner with you and to see what the lord is doing in and through your ministry what do you have going on right now what's next for you what's on your horizon well, I'll be speaking the, um, coming up. It's the uh, really second week of November. Cindy Jacobs brings together all the uh, Apostolic Council of Prophetic Elders. I'm honored to be on that wow. on that team. Uh, my friends Tommy and Miriam Evans are as well. So we are all coming together with you know, James Gall, Bill Hammond, Joseph Garlington, and really seeking the Lord collectively. Holy Spirit, what are you saying for the coming year? And what I love about what Cindy does is she has all of these different prophetic leaders um, operate in a place of fellowship, but in also accountability and alignment with each other. So there's no like rogue prophetic people delivering you know goofy words, that type of thing. Everybody's really submitted one to another. And it's a place where we kind of wrestle with, God, what are you saying? What is this person receiving? Okay, this is what I received. And you find it's like, oh, wow, we prophesy in part and you put all the parts together together hmm. and you start to get a bit of a whole you get a bit of a whole picture of what god is doing so that's coming up i'm honored to be part of that i'm going to be speaking at that event um and then going into the new year in january we've got a lot of events coming up in florida and new england just places places territorially god is highlighting you're coming to north carolina too we will be coming this year we'll yeah. figure we're going to figure it Charlotte, out north but, carolina we're so excited yep. about this oh it'll be it'll be a joy i i, I believe alan you know, and again, I can't claim this prophetic word, but if it, it, Tommy Evans gave this word, and I keep telling him, Tommy, you've got to release this, otherwise I'm just going to steal it. But he really <laughs> felt like as we're stepping into 2024, the Lord kept highlighting Psalm 24 to him. Hmm. And there is that wonderful portion of Psalm 24 that really, anytime somebody reads it, it stirs you, where it talks about opening up the gates yes. and letting the king of glory come in. And I really believe that's going to be a word of the Lord for the year that there are going to be gates in the spirit that are open over territories, over regions, over nations, over over churches as the people of God, as the church comes together and say, God, we will remove the hindrances. We will remove any obstruction. And we say, King of glory, come in, come to a Come into our churches, come into our schools, come into our homes. We need God and his full glory to shift things in our nations. Not just here in America, but around the world. That's one of the reasons why we're we're making our commitment in the coming year to partner with the persecuted church around the world and to work with them. We churches in the Middle East, as well as um, particularly in Israel and places like Pakistan. And uh, that's one of the reasons why. Do you like coffee? Brother, I probably need to be delivered because I don't drink. Oh, but who is that? Is that Wigglesworth this, on the coffee? This is the Wigglesworth blend that we have created. Wow. It's got a punch. I, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I might like coffee after that. Okay. Otherwise, I might need to Does your wife drink start. coffee? What we'll do is we'll send you yeah. some of the Wigglesworth blend. And oh. what we're doing to help us work with the persecuted church around the world, people who get a bag, they're helping us do that. And uh, so right now we're, we're making it a special offer for a gift of any size. We'll send you one bag. You get one bag for a gift of any size. After that, you go to our store. You can buy as many as you want uh, of the Wigglesworth blend, which we're super excited about. It's really, really good. 
And we want to encourage everybody to go to EncounterToday.com and get a hold of the Wigglesworth Blend Awakening Faith Coffee from Encounter Coffee. We want to create a whole parallel economy, Brother Larry, where people don't have to invest in a lot of these woke companies anymore to get things they use every single day. You can get the ground. You can get the whole bean. We now have both at our store if uh, you wow. want to go in there and get that. So we're super excited about that. So I'll send you some just so you have it as a as a novelty item, a conversation piece, even if yes. you don't drink it. I love it. Awesome. Larry, thank you so much. We're going to put the links for your ministry in the description here. What's the best way for people to contact you? I would say the best place is on Instagram, on Facebook, Larry Sparks, Larry Sparks Ministries. Although if you if you find the bluegrass singer, you've gone to the wrong That's one. who I always find, actually, the bluegrass yeah. singer. I was like, Larry, I didn't know you sang bluegrass. I, um, I might just start owning it and, and start saying that I do. But um. you've really started <laughs> to invest in uh, the Voice of Destiny YouTube channel, yes. which is a brand new channel where yes. you're interviewing people, kind of really digging into um, these prophetic issues that yep. we've been talking about. Yes, and that's where I would encourage people as well. And it's so new that I'm trying to remember to to tell people. We'll to go put a there. link. Uh, yeah, please, please do because, yeah. I, you know, I love the prophetic, but I'll, I'll tell you honestly, we publish the prophets. My heart burns more for revival. So that the the unique thing what we do at Voice of Destiny is find these prophetic leaders who are receiving words of the Lord on what is the Holy Spirit saying and mm. doing right now. I believe prophetic words are actually meant to mobilize us of course. into revival. revive us. So yes. yep. So, a yes. prophetic Thank word you, is when the sword of the word mm. comes alive and pierces the moment. I love that. And yes. and it engages the heart and causes us to be revived. Yep. So the two are certainly hand in hand in the voice of destiny. You've got some amazing interviews on there. You interviewed Costi Hinn. Yes. The conversation that you had with him is out of this world. Everybody needs to watch that interview. It, it was wonderful. And, uh, you know, he might be a great person for you to connect with one day because candidly, you know, we obviously differ on a lot of things, yes. and none of us budged. But I love the fact that there was such a sweet spirit of unity on that, and that's that's what I long for. I long for in the body of Christ. We got to figure out how to disagree and maintain fellowship. Yeah, I know. I I know that. You know what? I'll tell you the secret: the Holy Ghost. <laughs> I think He's the only one who can make that possible. That's exactly right. I feel yeah. bad for people who live in a cloistered environment. You know, they're like in an echo chamber, and they're always surrounded by people who yeah. agree with them. I don't feel like. I ever talk to anyone who agrees with me. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I and I, I actually love reading material. Uh, I don't want to read heresy, but I do want right. to read perspectives that are going to be iron that sharpen me. That's so, exactly right. Yeah. Well, yeah. you are an amazing gift to the body. We thank God for you and thank you for pouring thank into you, us. If you've enjoyed this interview, guys, share it. Get it in front of as many people as possible, and we'll see you next time right here on Encounter Today. Be sure to get your coffee, the Wigglesworth Bren, EncounterToday.com. Link in the description. God bless. Attention all revivalists and passionate believers. We're excited to announce Encounter Coffee has a new blend called the Wigglesworth Blend. The Wigglesworth Blend is a new, unique, bold roast of coffee designed to awaken you and your faith in the mornings. And with every single bag of coffee we send, you are helping us to set slaves free from human trafficking. With each cup of coffee, you are contributing to help us liberate children from the blight of human trafficking. Right now, for a gift of any size, you can get your very first bag of the Wigglesworth Blend if you go to EncounterToday.com and click on the special offer. If you would like more bags of coffee, you can go to the Encounter store and get as many as you like. But let's set slaves free together. Let's advance the gospel together with Encounter Coffee.